a reading from the first book of Samuel. Samuel said to Saul, Stop, let me tell you what the Lord said to me last night. Saul replied, Speak. Samuel then said, Though little in your own esteem, are you not leader of the tribe of Israel? The Lord I know to you, King of Israel, and sent you on a mission, saying, Go and put the sinful Amalekites under a van of destruction. Fight against them until you have exterminated them. Why then had you disobeyed the Lord? You have pounced on the spoil, thus displeasing the Lord. Samuel answers, I did indeed obey the Lord and fulfill the mission on which the Lord sent me. I have brought back Agag, and I have destroyed Amalek under the van. But from the spoil, the men took sheep and oxen, the best of what had been banded, to sacrifice to the Lord their God in Gilead. But Samuel said, Does the Lord so delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obedience to the command of the Lord? Obedience is better than sacrifice and submission to the fact of rams. For sin like divination is rebellion and presumption is the crime of idolatry. Because you have rejected the command of the Lord, he too has rejected you as ruler. Verbum Domini. To the upright, I will show the saving power of God. Not for your sacrifices do I rebuke you, for your burnt offerings are before me always. I take from your house no bullock, nor ghost out of your fold. Why do you recite my statutes and profess my covenant with your mouth, though you hate discipline and cast my words behind you? When you do these things, shall I be deaf to it? Or do you think that I am like yourself? I will correct you by drawing them up before your eyes. He that offends praise as a sacrifice glorifies me, and to him that goes the right way, I will show the salvation of God. which overcomes the strife of the world. They followed the Lord and attained the heavenly kingdom. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Dominus Fabiscum. Lexio Sancti Evangelii Secundum Marcum. Gloria 
The disciples of John and of the Pharisees were accustomed to fast. People came to Jesus and objected, why do the disciples of John and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? Jesus answered them, can the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. But the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast on that day. No one sews a piece of unshrunken cloth on an old cloak. If he does, its fullness pulls away, and the new, the new from the old and the tear gets worse. Likewise, no one pours new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the wine will burst the skins and both the wine and the skins are ruined. Rather, new wine is poured into fresh wineskins. Verbum Domini. The Wall Street Journal had a remarkable article August 20th, 2011, written by the Chief Rabbi of London. And in that, he very accurately diagnoses the cause of the moral breakdown in the Western society. But then he also gives a formula for rebuilding. What did we hear in today's responsorial psalm? You hate discipline and cast my words behind you. When you do these things, shall I be deaf to it or do you think that I am like yourself? I will correct you by drawing them up before your eyes. But it concluded today with words of hope. But he that offers praise as a sacrifice glorifies me. And to him that goes the right way, I will show the salvation of God. So Rabbi, <coughs> Rabbi Jonathan Sachs talked about how this past April 2011, there was a wonderful event in British society of the marriage of William and Kate the streets lined with the cheering crowds and a joyous celebration. But less than four months later, hooded youths ran riot down the high streets, smashing windows, looting shops, setting fires to cars, attacking passerbys and throwing rocks at the police. In fact, a few people died during those uh, riots. And people were shocked by that. Text messaging, could bring crowds into the streets that for a while were impossible to control. It took everyone by surprise, Rabbi Sachs says, but it should not have. The 1960s, he says, there was a moral revolution, the abandonment of its entire traditional ethic of self-restraint. All you need, sang the Beatles, is love. The Judeo-Christian moral code was jettisoned. In its place came whatever works for you. You hate discipline and cast my words behind you. And he went on to say, you do not have to be a Victorian sentimentalist to realize that something has gone badly wrong since. In Britain today, more than 40% of children are born outside of marriage. This has led to new forms of child poverty that serious government spending has failed to cure. In 2007, a UNICEF report found that Britain's children are the unhappiest in the world. The 2011 riots are one result, but there are others. 
Whole communities are growing up without fathers or male role models. Bringing up a family in the best of circumstances is not easy. To try to do it by placing the entire burden on women, 90% of single parent families in Britain are headed by the mother, is practically absurd and morally indefensible. By the time boys are in their early teens, they're physically stronger than their mothers. Having no fathers, they are socialized in gangs. No one can control them. Not parents, teachers, or even the local police. There are areas in Britain's major cities that have been no-go areas for years. Crime is rampant, so are drugs. This is a recipe for violence and despair. In fact, he went on to say that 25% of those involved in the riots belong to gangs. But this is something that has been building for years. Unsocialized young people deprived of parental care or guidance. But then he says a statement that we might find surprising. The truth is, it is not their fault. They are the victims of the tsunami of wishful thinking that has washed across the West, saying that you can have sex without the responsibility of marriage, children without the responsibility of parenthood, social order without the responsibility of citizenship, liberty without the responsibility of morality, and self-esteem without the responsibility of work and earned achievement. What has happened morally in the West is what has happened financially as well. Good and otherwise sensible people were persuaded that you could spend more than you earn, incur debt at unprecedented levels, and consume the world's resources without thinking about who will pay the bill and when. It has been the culture of the free lunch in a world where there are no free lunches. We have been spending our moral capital with the same reckless abandon that we have been spending our financial capital. Freud was right. The precondition of civilization is the ability to defer the gratif gratification of instinct. And even Freud, who disliked religion and called it the obsessional neurosis of mankind, realized that it was a Judeo-Christian ethic that trained people to control their appetites. The Judeo-Christian ethic that trained people to control their appetites. And that, what is the message that is continually promulgated through the media today? Mor morality is passé. Conscience is for wimps. But then he says, is there a way out? Has this, is this something that has happened before? Is there a way back from this moral decline and moral decay? And he says the answer to both questions is yes. In the 1820s, in both Britain and America, a similar phenomenon occurred. People were moving from villages to cities. Families were disrupted. Young people were separated from their parents and no longer under their control. Alcohol consumption rose dramatically. So did violence. In the 1820s, it was unsafe to walk the streets of London because of pickpockets by day and unruly ruffians by night. But what happened over the next 30 years was a massive shift in public opinion. There was an unprecedented growth in charities, friendly societies, working men's institutes, temperance groups, church and synagogue associations, Sunday schools, YMCA buildings, and moral campaigns of every shape and size fighting slavery or child labor or inhuman working conditions. The common factor was their focus on building the moral character, self-discipline, 
willpower and personal responsibility of individuals. It worked. Within a single generation, crime rates came down and social order was restored. What was achieved was nothing less than the remoralization of society, much of it driven by religion. He quotes a couple of Harvard teachers, professors. The first is a Harvard sociologist, Robert Putnam, who talks about the breakdown in social capital, he calls it, what he calls bowling alone. More people were going bowling, but fewer were joining teams. It was a symbol of the loss of community, of rampant individualism. But he said that this social capital has not disappeared. Where is it found? It's found in churches, synagogues, other places of worship. Religious people, he discovered, make better neighbors and citizens. They are more likely to give to charity, to volunteer, to assist a homeless person, to donate blood, to spend time with someone feeling depressed or offer a seat to a stranger, to help someone find a job or take part in local civic life. Affiliation to a religious community, Robert Putnam said, is the best predictor of altruism and empathy, better than education, age, income, gender, or race. So what is he, he's saying is that society needs religion. And we would say, in particular, the Judeo-Christian ethic. Because it shapes behavior. It's a tutor in morality. And I like this statement. It's an ongoing seminar in self-restraint in the pursuit of the common good. By, the, by particip participating in uh, religious exercises, in the Judeo-Christian ethic, we're continually, as it were, going to an ongoing seminar of how to restrain our unruly impulses and to pursue not just our own selfish good, but the, the, the common good. The other professor that he quotes, Harvard historian Niall Ferguson, who wrote a book, Civilization, and he asked whether the West can maintain its primacy on the world stage, or if it's a civilization in decline. He quotes a member of the Chinese Academy of Social Scientists, Sciences, a member of the Chi Chinese Academy of Social Sciences, tasked with finding out what gave the West its dominance. He said, at first we thought it was your guns. Then we thought it was your political system, democracy. Then we said it was your economic system, capitalism. But for the last 20 years, we have known that it was your religion. And so the rabbi concludes, it was the Judeo-Christian heritage that gave the West its restless pursuit of a tomorrow that would be better than today. The Chinese have learned the lesson. 50 years after Chairman Mao declared China a religion-free zone, there are now more Chinese Christians than there are members of the Communist Party. China has learned the lesson. The question is, will we? You hate discipline, and you cast my words behind you. When you do these things, shall I be deaf to it? Or do you think that I am like yourself? I will correct you by drawing them up before your eyes. But he that offers praise as a sacrifice glorifies me, and to him that goes the right way, I will show the salvation of God. What does Jesus say in today's gospel? That there is something new at work in what he is doing, in what he is teaching. You can't use old, brittle 
wine skins to put new wine that's still fermenting, uh, put it in that because that new wine ferments and it expands and it's gonna burst those brittle old skins. It's something new that's going on. It's something that's alive. What did Peter say, or what did the people say at Pentecost? They said, when they heard those that were filled with the Spirit, they said, they're filled with new wine. And they were wrong that they were drunk, but they were right that they were filled with new wine. It was a new wine of the Spirit. It was a new work of God's grace. It's what has brought all the blessings of Western civilization that we know and enjoy today. And for us to reject our heritage, for us to want an atheocracy, some kind of society without God, it simply is not going to work. And Rabbi Sachs points that out so very clearly and profoundly for us. But there is a way back. There was a way for us to rebuild, and all of us are involved in that. That's what the work of EWTN is about. That's what all of us who are with us through television and radio, all of you who are present here, the remoralization of society. That's the mission God gives to us that we bring the Judeo-Christian ethic, the teachings of our Lord, of our Savior, who saves us as individual, who saves us as a society, to bring that to bear in society, to bring that to bear in our own lives and in the lives of others, in our families, and so on. This is the salvation. To him who goes the right way, I will show the salvation of God, the psalmist prayed. So let us continue to work with hope and with faith that God can and he will use us to help to rebuild this society. The martyrs that we celebrate today, the first martyrs of the Franciscan order, they had that courage to bring the faith to those who did not yet know it, and they died in proclaiming that faith. You and I need that strength, and we ask them to intercede for us in our own challenges today, that we'll have the strength to stand faith, fast and to hold fast to our faith and to let God use us as his instruments to rebuild our society and its moral capital. <laughs>